And you know, it's kind of fun for me, honestly. The kids can also be dismissed. Kids, if you're all checked in for uh, Freedom Kids, you can make your way to your classroom now. There'll be a huge mad rush. But it's really fun for me to introduce for you, that, for most of you, a man that needs no introduction, uh, our friend Ben Davitt. And it's kind of fun because Ben and I were in the same graduating class. Two Bens in the same graduating class, have known two each other. Three. Yeah, and uh, two of three Bens in the in the <laughs> class, and uh, so you get two of three Bens in the graduating class of the year two thousand. Lucky, lucky you guys. But uh, what's cool is you know, and it's with it being t- over twenty years now, um, you never know what's going to happen in your life, do you? How the Lord's going to work, and with the, the lives of your friends and. How, uh, you know, honestly, we went different ways for a lot of years and how God and his grace has brought us into the same place here. And uh, Ben has been leading the men's ministry here, and and you guys are well familiar with who he is. But uh, he works at the VA, and today he's working for the Lord Jesus Christ. He's really, you know, leading us this morning. And so uh, we're very happy to have him uh, preach a message in this series that we've been in together, Characters, Cast, and Crew. So, Ben, thank you for agreeing to do this. Yeah, thank and, you. And uh, we look forward to what the Lord's going to speak through you today, brother. Thank Thanks, you so man. much. Appreciate yeah, it. brother. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, this will either be the longest sermon you've ever sat through or the shortest. I haven't quite gotten there yet. Um, like Ben said, my name is Ben Davitt. Uh, I'm the men's group leader um, here at Fellowship, Freedom Fellowship. And my wife and I have been coming here three years, three or four years. Gable's real little. Um, And uh, we've really just, this church has just embraced our family so much. And uh, I'm just humbled and honored to have this opportunity to be up here in front of you guys today. So um, before we start, I just want to say a quick prayer. Lord, Um, Thank you for this time together. Thank you for the folks that are here. Um, May your words come through clearly, um, Lord, and uh, just uh, let your message be clear. Um, Remove me from the situation and and let you shine. I ask this in your name. Amen. So when they gave me the list, or they said, we're going through the Old Testament characters, cast, and crew. Kind of uh, interesting to see the different folks that most of which, or a lot of them we've already seen, um, and then some of them that are coming that are pretty interesting too, but um, Elijah really kind of settled with me. Um, there's, a, there's a question that we'll get to, but in chapter 19 of 1 Kings, um, Elijah's in this cave, and God asks him, what are you doing here? And (laughs) throughout this process, I found myself asking myself the same question. Um, What am I doing here? Some of you probably saw me walk in this morning going, what are you doing here? Um, And, but um, looking back now, um, I can see that it's been coming. We are in places in our lives where it's really hard to figure out how in the heck did I get here? And uh, so um, to start off, I just want to tell you a little story. Um, It was 2007, and I was 25 years old, um, and I was wild and free and doing my own thing and um, it was February February 3rd um, it was a Saturday night and I remember because it was Super Bowl Sunday and we'll, I'll get there here in just a second but um, I went out with some friends it was wild crazy making really bad choices um, woke up the next morning and I was like what and it like, totally convicted me what are you doing what are you doing here? Like, how did you get here? And uh, and so that was, that next morning was the 4th, 2007, February 4th, Super Bowl Sunday. And 
And so I got up, and I got in my car, and I just started praying. I was like, I knew I was lost. And if, uh, if I kept going down this road, it's not going to go well. And uh, so I got home, and at the time I was living with my folks trying to save money. And uh, just kind of roaming around the house, and um, I was getting ready to leave. And the reason I remember Super Bowl Sunday is because I was going to go to a Super Bowl party um, that night. And I was getting ready to leave, and my mom looks at me, and she goes, you okay? Um, just kind of unloaded. I said, no, I'm not. I am I'm not okay. I am lost. I'm looking for happiness in the wrong places. I'm looking... Like, and part of my prayer when I was in my car was, God, just give me somebody to stabilize me. And um, somebody to give me a greater purpose than myself, because I'm going to screw this up big time. And so it had become unknowns to me um, that Sarah Shaw, um, who it was my, um, my mom was babysitting Joe when he was a baby. And her and my mom and Sarah had developed this really close relationship. And she looked at me and she goes, have you ever thought about asking out Sarah? Actually, yes, I have. Because I mysteriously kept running into her at hy V. <clears throat> and so she said, without betraying any trust, I think that it would be a good idea. So I called her. I was out of town, and I just called her and asked her out. My buddy, they were having a surprise birthday party for a friend of mine, and it was, um, I said, would you like to go with me? And her response, in true Sarah form, of course. <laughs> okay, that was the easiest date I've ever asked for in my life. <laughs> um, and so all that to say, February 10th, was our first date, and we have never parted since. And when I was in a place where I cried out to God, I said, what are you doing here? What am I doing here? God answered. God spoke to me. God provided. And he's been with us every step of the way. So, you know, when, when you think about you know, you get in those situations, and sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, you know, but you're like, where, what are you doing here? You know, and, and depending on where you're at is kind of where that question lands on you, you know, when you say that question to yourself inside your head, you know, it could be, what are you doing here? Like, oh my gosh, this is so awesome, or what are you doing here? You know, and it, and the context of that has completely changes how um, the meaning, the answer, and it's going to change. As Christians, it changes, you know? Um, and so, you know, the answer to this question can change depending on where we are in life. Um, and our answers may change frequently. Um, but throughout those changes and, and wherever you are right now, this very moment, there are four truths um, that going through Elijah um, that really resonated with me, and, and it was very clear that these were the four things that um, needed to be mentioned. And so, um, again, regardless of where you're at on your journey, how you answer that question, what are you doing here? Um, these four, there are four things that we're going to go through and talk about for that. Um, before we get there, I just want to give you some background on Elijah, just kind of the history and, and stuff. Um, so um, it's, it's after King Solomon. So there were the first three kings, Saul, David, Solomon. After Solomon died, the, the tribes, the northern tribes, revolted, and they split. So you had Israel to the north and Judah to the south. And um, the... The Israelites, um, how they got the kings was they wanted one. They, 
didn't, they've kind of wavered in their faith to God being the king over their lives. And, and so he, or, and so Samuel anointed Saul for God's word. And so when they split, it was not good. And, and there were lots of different kings, and most of them were really bad dudes. And so in, when, in Elijah's time, um, there was a king called Ahab and his wife Jezebel. And these two were horrible human beings. They were beyond evil. Um, they were going around um, killing all the prophets. Um, they were, they, they worshiped Baal. And so anybody that didn't worship Baal, they were basically trying to eliminate the word of God. And so in uh, 1 Kings chapter 16, um, verse 30 and 33, Ahab, son of Omri, Omri, did not, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him, and did more to arouse the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than did all the kings before him. Not a good guy. So here comes Elijah, and he shows up, and the first, we don't really hear too much about him, and then all of a sudden he's um, in a cave, or he's by this brook being fed by ravens. God's feeding him. Um, not much is known about Elijah. Not much is known about his family history. Nobody even knows how old he is when he comes onto the scene. I've read different things that said he was anywhere from maybe 30, 40, 50 years old. They really have no idea. Um, there's a, if you want to go to the next slide, Jonah. So they think that he, they called him Elijah the Tishbite. And honestly, this is the only map I could find that actually showed where Tishba, Tishbe, actually was. They just know that it was east of the Jordan and the, in the country of Gilead. And so um, Elijah shows up and he basically um, chastises the king and says, until I speak another word, there will be no rain, not even dew. There is a d just drought because you people are so bad, God's shutting the rain off. And so there was drought, there was famine, there was all these terrible things. And so, um, and then through Elijah, God worked in some really crazy really crazy things, like, again, with the ravens creating him food. I mean, the bird just showed up with food and fed him when he was out in the middle of nowhere. Um, Elijah called down the fire of heaven three times, once on Mount Carmel and then two more times on King Ahaziah, Ahaziah um, after Ahab died. Um, he was able, he met a woman um, in uh, clear up there north, um, Zarephath, he met this widow, and she was picking up sticks so that she could go home and make her last meal for her and her son. She mentions, I'm going to take these so that I may make food and die. Like, it was so bad. Like, she was done. And Elijah told her, go home and make some bread and bring it to me, and, and you will have plenty of food. And so she did that, and she had a jar of flour, and, a, and a, so when she went home, there was just a little bit of oil and a little bit of flour. She makes his, this loaf of bread and brings it, gives it to Elijah. From that point on, until the famine ended, her flour jar and her oil never ran out. Um, he, uh, and then while Elijah's there, um, her son became sick and died, and Elijah cries out to God and says, why have you done this to this woman? You've sent me here, and now you are taking her son. And, and Elijah takes the boy upstairs and covers him three times and prays to the Lord. And the boy comes back to life. And he carries him back downstairs and said, he's alive. So he... Um, and then after... after um, Mount Carmel, which I'm going to get to that here in a few minutes, but after he, him and the showdown with Elijah and the prophets of Baal, he, uh, 
he takes off and wanders the desert for 40 days and 40 nights with no food or water on his way to Mount Sinai. Um, and then um, I've only got two more for you, and then I'll get to the point. Um, but it's just, just you got to read it. It starts in 1 Kings chapter 17 and goes through 2 Kings chapter 2 through 11. It's just a crazy story. It's very cool. Um, but Elijah did not experience death. He was taken up to heaven in a chariot of fire. <clears throat> and then um, the last time we see um, Elijah in the Bible is on the Mount Transfiguration when Jesus and Moses and Elijah are standing on top of the mountain with James and John, and I can't remember if it was anybody, I think there was somebody else, but, and that's where they want to build the tent. They're like, that's good that we're here with you because Jesus, Moses, and Elijah are standing there physically in front of them talking. So, um, so what are the, what are the points then? Um, so the points are, um, God speaks to each of us, um, is the first point. And God speaks, God spoke to Adam in the garden God spoke to Jacob in a vision in a dream in Genesis 28. Exodus 3 and 19, he spoke to Moses through fire. He spoke to Samuel audibly to the point where he woke up and responded. He thought Eli had called him. Um, he spoke to Mary and Zechariah through the angel Gabriel. How many thousands of people did Jesus speak to um, and still speaks to to this day? Um, and then, um, and then the Holy Spirit. God sends the Holy Spirit to all of us who accept Christ to guide and direct us. Um, when God spoke to Elijah, he listened. Um, he sent, he sent um, Elijah to the Kareth Ravine, um, east of the Jordan, back towards his homeland, um, after he called for the drought, because... Um, he knew that you know Ahab and Jezebel were looking for him, and then um, when the brook dried up at the ravine, that's when he sent him to Zarephath for the, to take care of the widow and her son. Um, after the showdown on Mount Carmel, which we'll get to, um, Elijah kind of freaks out and takes off because Jezebel says, "By the end of tomorrow, you're dead. I'm coming for you." And so he takes off and leaves. Well, he, he runs, I mean, he just goes. And he's clear out in the middle of nowhere. And he lays down under this bush because he's so tired and falls asleep. Jesus, it says the angel of the Lord, which we've learned in past weeks, is, is Jesus Christ, came to him and said, get up and eat. And Elijah woke up and there's food, there's bread and water in the middle of the wilderness under a bush, right? Um... And then I've got, can you pull up that other map? So he's, so what, oh, that's not very good, sorry. Um, so, but basically, so when he takes off from Jezreel, which is clear up at the top where the arrows start, and he, that's where he's at when um, Jezebel threatens him. And he goes all the way down to the Sinai Peninsula to Mount, what the Bible calls Mount Horeb, the mountain of God, or Mount Sinai. All, it's all three of them are the same thing. And that's when Jesus says, the journey is too much for you, get up and eat. Um, so, anyway, God, God's always communicating with us, whether it's through thought, through spirit, um, Sometimes you'll hear a verse or a worship song, and it just kind of hits you in a place where you're not expecting it. And I, f I fully believe that that's the Holy Spirit, and God's trying to, trying to get you, trying to tell you something, trying to convict you. Um, and, and we don't have to be prophets like Elijah to have God speak to us. We just have to be open. We just have to be willing. Um, he knows the most effective means for communicating with us. Um, and, you know, Pastor Jeff's talked about this, and, ben as, and Pastor Ben as well. 
you know, no one comes to Christ on their own. It's because he called you. And um, as we pursue a relationship with Christ, we can better hear him. So um, God sent, um, and, and Jesus tells us, John 14, verses 15 and 16 and 26. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So the first point, God speaks. Are we listening? Second point, God hears and he listens. Um, after the prophecy of the drought, um, God sent Elijah to that Kareth ravine for protection um, because he doesn't just listen to us. He knows what our enemies have planned too. Um, and, and so, um, and then, so Mount Carmel, there's all these, so uh, Jezebel and Ahab are, Jezebel was the original one. She converted Ahab to worship Baal. And, and so there's 450 prophets of Baal at this time. And, and so Elijah um, calls him out and says, all right, we're going to find out who the real God is. And so they go to Mount Carmel. And he has them pick two of the choice bulls and says, bring them up. You guys are going to sacrifice one, and I'm going to sacrifice the other. And whichever one God responds to is the true God. And so he, uh, the, the prophets of Baal come out, and they build their altar, and they get the sacrifice prepared and the wood and everything ready and they're calling down you know Baal light the light the altar light the sacrifice they're calling and calling and calling and dancing around and and Elijah's just taunting them he's like cheer louder cheer louder maybe they're maybe he can't hear you maybe he's busy keep cheering keep louder let us hear it come on and and this goes on for like hours I think it says till noon or middle, midday, and, and finally Elijah's like, all right. So he builds an altar, 12 stones, one for each tribe of Israel, the wood, the sacrifice, and he, has, and he tells them, build a trench around the, around the altar. So he builds a trench, and he tells them, go get jars of water, and he says, pour it on the sacrifice. So they pour it on. He's like, okay, do it again. So they do it again said, okay, do it again, one more time. So it's just completely soaked, right? Like, and the trench is full of water. Like, it talks about the water is flowing out of the trench. And, and so then Elijah calls out to God, answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God, and that you are turning, your heart, turning their hearts back again. Then fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the soil, and it also licked up all the water in the trench. Like that. Burn up everything. God was listening. Um, and then, so then after that happens, Ahab goes back to the palace and like, I'm sure he was wigging out because he's, he goes back to Jezebel and tells her all the stuff that happened. And she sends a messenger to, a to Elijah and says, by this time tomorrow, I'm going to get you. You know, may God um, punish me ever so severely if by the end of tomorrow you're not, I don't get you. And so after having this profound boldness before God, he just... He wigs out and leaves. Like, he just takes off running. And so, um, so it says in 1 Kings 19, 3, 
Elijah was so afraid, he ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. And he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. So he's at a pretty dark point in his life right now. Even after standing there, calling down the fire of God and showing all these people who God truly was and what God was capable of, and then instantly had a down moment where he's struggling. Um, and so, I mean, he was scared, he was depressed, he was exhausted. Um, but God heard his pleas. Um, he didn't give him what he wanted, thank God. But um, he... Uh, that's when Jesus shows up and says, yo, get up and eat. And he gave him the bread and the water. And he ate it and he fell back to sleep. And, 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 he, and Jesus comes back again. He's like, get up and eat. This journey is too long for you. Well, it doesn't tell us where he's going. Like, you, know, you don't really know for sure. Well, then Elijah gets up. And just from the food and the water that Jesus gave him, he was able to go from... Um, Beersheba, or at least a day's walk from there, and then he walked to Mount Horeb, or Mount Sinai. And um, Elijah gets there. Of course, after 40 days and 40 nights, he's exhausted. Um, and, and he's in the cave, and word of the Lord comes to Elijah. And he says, And Elijah replies, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then the Lord and then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire came a gentle whisper. Even when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And so then Elijah goes back through like he didn't hear him the first time and tells him all the things that he just told him about, I'm the only one and whatever. God's like, no. You need to go back to Damascus, and on the way you're going to anoint uh, you're going to anoint Hazael, Jehu and Elisha. The first two are kings. <clears throat> and so, and he also tells him, I have all, there are also 7,000 other Israelites who have not bowed down and worshiped Baal. You are not the only one. So, you know, God was listening. God spoke to him and God encouraged him and gave him guidance. And um, it just, um, and it's reiterated in Micah 7. But as for me, I will watch and hope for the Lord. I wait for the God, wait for God my Savior. My God will hear me. 1 John 5, 14. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Because Jesus Christ and of his loving sacrifice for all people, everybody, the veil of he between heaven and earth was ripped apart, and we now can approach God, talk, cry, cry out in your car, whatever. You can directly communicate with God, and he will hear you. So, first, again, God speaks. Second, God listens. Are we talking to him? My third point is God provides. In Hebrew, there's a Hebrew name for, well, there's a lot of Hebrew names, but one of the Hebrew names for God 
is Yahweh Ira, and I had to look it up. Um, and it means the Lord will provide. God provided Elijah with prophecy. He provided with warning for protection. He provided his basic needs, food, water, shelter. He provided guidance. Do this, go here, you know, this is what you're going to do. And Elijah listened. Whenever God talked to him, he listened. Um, he, he provided life. Um, he, God worked a miracle through Elijah, or using Elijah to feed the widow and her son. He resurrected the son from the dead. He provided conviction. Um, he gave Elijah courage to stand in front of a, a wicked king that he knew was trying to hunt down everybody like him and call down the thunder, basically. Um, he gave him boldness. Um, I can only imagine what it must have been like to be standing there on Mount Carmel when he's just, all those prophets of Baal are just doing their thing and Elijah's just, just the boldness to sit there and be like, come on, let's do it. You got this. Let's go. What are you doing? Like just rag, agging him on and just, um, he gives us signs and responses. Um, he gives us perseverance. How many times are you in a tough situation and you cry out to God and the next thing you know, you're through it? Um, strength and endurance, which kind of is like perseverance, but um, in Ahab, or in uh, 1 Kings 18, 46, after the Mount Carmel thing, um, the rain, God had told Elijah that the rain was going to come. And so he tells Ahab, go back, go eat and drink and be merry. The rain's going to come. And so, and then at that, and so he goes up on top of the mountain and he's praying and he tells his um, assistant um, or servant, go, go look and see if there's any rain. He goes, nope, nothing. Do it again, 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 seven times. Last time he says there's a cloud, the that's small. I can't remember the actual size, like the size of a man's hand or a man's head or something like that. And within a few moments, it's pouring. And at that time, Ahab, or Elijah tells Ahab, just go. Go do your thing. Go celebrate your God. Go do whatever. And then, but it says, the power of the Lord came over Elijah, and he ran back to Jezreel. He tucked in his robe and took, he outran a chariot to town. That's some strength and endurance. He got, he got Elijah to Mount Sinai in 40 days on some bread and a couple jars of water. Um, he gave him encouragement. Come on, you got this. You're not the only one. You may think you are, and we don't, you know, you don't really know if he's being self-righteous or if he really thinks, because they had killed so many prophets trying to eliminate God. And for the sake of Baal. And, and God always gave him encouragement. Let's go. You got this. We're going to do this. You're going to do this. You're going to do this. And he did. Grace. He provided grace, as he does for each and every one of us. Um, he even got the grace of God. This is interesting. So um, he even gives grace to Ahab. Ahab wanted this vineyard, and the guy wouldn't sell it. And so he told his wife, and she had her cronies go set this whole thing up, this dinner, and had this um, Naboth, I believe is the guy's name, had him come, and they said, put these scoundrels around him and have them make up lies to, so we can arrest this guy, basically. And they arrested him for blaspheming the Lord, which is ironic, but, um, and they stoned him. To death, just so the king could have his vineyard. And, and, and so God talks to Elijah, and he's telling him, you know, they did these things. They murdered Naboth. They got his vineyard. He said, you need to go tell Ahab what's coming. And so he shows up, and he says, you know, all of your descendants, the ones that die in town will be eaten by dogs. The ones that die in the country will be eaten by birds. It is going to be brutal. You are done. Like all this. And Ahab rips his clothes and falls down 
and kind of repent. And, and God says to Elijah, did you see that? It was incredible. He said, so he took, his, he, he took the, the threat off of Ahab and said it will go pass on to his son. And his son was a bad dude too. You can read more about him on your own. But in all of his terrible, the most evil king Israel had ever seen to that point, even God extended him grace. Paul reminds us in Philippians 4.19, my God will meet your needs according to the riches in his glory in Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean you're always going to get what you pray for, and it doesn't mean it's going to look like what you think it should. The important thing to remember is that God's speaking, God listens, and God provides. No is still an answer. Not right now or silence is still an answer. And sometimes God says, watch this. And he's sitting down the fire from on Mount Carmel. God does not always reveal himself in magnificent and power way, powerful ways. If we all look for a miraculous event, we often miss the gentle whisper found in the quiet and easily overlooked moments. He always provides. Always. It may not look the way we want it, and it, and it may not, but it is the way he intended it. And we have to remember that. God speaks. God listens. God provides. Are we acknowledging what he's given us? The last thing is God stays. Before Jesus is born, the angel tells, I believe, Mary, that Jesus will be called Emmanuel because he, he's God with us. God doesn't promise that life will be easy. Jesus, Jesus even tells us it's not going to get any easier. In fact, it's probably going to get worse because they hate me. It will get worse because they hate me. But I've already won. So, um, so God stays. God stays willingly. Joshua 1, verses 5 and 9. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave nor forsake you. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. God stays loving. Psalm 144, 2. He is my loving God and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer, my shield in whom I take refuge. God stays merciful. Luke 6, 36. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. Is, not was, not going to be, is, always. God stays generous. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. God stays with us. Deuteronomy 31.8. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. And do not be discouraged. God stays the same. Hebrews 13.8. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God speaks to us. God hears us. God provides, and God stays. He stays in our presence. Are we taking the time to enter into his? So, to tie it all up, you know, the Bible goes over and over and over. I mean, you, from Genesis to Revelation, these things are apparent throughout. This isn't something that Ben Davitt figured out reading Elijah. But Elijah showed me the different ways that he does in a different way. Um, so we just have to remember that when we're in fellowship with God, we are better able to recognize when God shows his presence in our lives. You can't get away from him. Psalm 139, verses 7 through 12. 
Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light becomes night around me, even darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like day, for the darkness is as light to you. So, just remember, when that question pops into your head, what are you doing? God is speaking. God is listening. God will provide for you in that place. And God will be with you in the middle of it. Whatever, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, and however you got there, these four things will remain true forever. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you today. Uh, thank you for today. Um, thank you for an opportunity to share your word, um, Lord. And I just pray that these words were clear and your presence was felt here by me very clearly. And um, I just thank you. As we go from here, Lord, let us know that you are always with us. You stay forever. You guide us, protect us, lead us, talk to us, love us. Lord, and I just thank you for that. And I thank you for this day. Let us go in peace in your name. Amen. Have a good day.